Greetings, explorers. Welcome to In the Fog. Tonight you will be told a story that seems unbelievable. It is a story about another world deep beneath ours. It is a world that exists in nightmare and darkness, one where our kind are not welcome. You will be taking a risk by listening to this tale. If you do not want to know about the world that exists under us, turn back now. For the rest of you, I humbly present Oceana's Necropolis. Sunken. The dead sunken. A burial ground where those ancient things are honored by such unspeakable beings of the vast depths. I must hurry as my time is on the verge of ending completely, but I must tell you such things before it is too late, before I enter that abyssal state, that ghastly chasm where only the most vile monstrosities of the ocean may dwell. I had been a marine biologist, working amongst several colleagues in different fields, away off the coast of New Zealand. However, this was still away south of Fiji. Our objective? Studying a recently abandoned excavation site, which had previously been subject to scientists working with Fiji's government. That expedition had ultimately failed due to the increasingly dangerous spikes in activity of vicious predators ranging from box jellies to moray eels and a rash of unexplained attack patterns. At least, that's what we were told by the official report. Whilst I had been primarily focused on studying the bizarre patterns of marine life surrounding the excavation site, I was just as intrigued by the seemingly ancient place where we performed our studies. The entire site was of rather small proportion, a slightly sunken in clearing of the light-colored tropical sand, miraculously devoid of most coral, rocks, or other unwanted debris, rather. What this clearing of sand held in the interest of my geologist companions were several stone protrusions curving upward from the gentle sand floor. These were not mere rocks, mind you, but curved horn-like objects emerging only a couple meters from the ocean floor. And most curiously of all was the material and texture of these objects, a smooth, shining black stone perfect in its composition. My first thought was that these were somehow obsidian-carved objects. However, the geologists were quick to determine that this was not the case. Intrigued as I was by the oddity my companions were studying, I had my own set of scientific obligations. Indeed, were the local populations of all living things erratic, if not downright unnatural in their behaviors, deadly man-of-wars often drew within near-fatal distance of the excavation team and would be dispatched with our spear guns only for us to fear the toxins of their disintegrated corpses. Likewise, local shark populations acted more aggressively, leaving us no choice but to kill those which threatened our work. This, in particular, disturbed me. These animals had never acted so aggressive towards any group of divers in all my years of study. It was simply not in their nature, and even the coral, that which was outside the sand clearing, grew in angles, pointing away from the site as if they were trying to flee the situation. One geologist jested that we had found sunken Atlantis, and these aquatic dwellers intended to kill us before we could discover those ancient treasures. I found no humor in this. Something was dreadfully wrong with the excavation site. The following day, as we tended to our usual work at the site, I was shocked by the echoing screams of what sounded like all of my colleagues combined. Already holding a spear gun, I braced myself to ward off some aggressive shark or man of war, only to drop the weapon in sheer awe as the realization came over me that we were a man short. One of my colleagues had seemed to 
disappear. After swimming over, a cluster of panicked geologists gathered around the center of the sand clearing, everything became clear. The middle of this clearing was pulling inwards in a massive movement of sand being pulled under. One of the men had been pulled under the clearing. Even among the most disciplined and stubbornly logical minds present was a sense of overwhelming anxiety and outright hysteria. A man, a whole man, scuba tank and all, pulled under the sand. In a burst of energy, or perhaps driven by primal but foolish human instinct, I pushed several of my colleagues aside and dug into the moving passageway of sand. Within seconds... My entire body had been pulled through as it occurred to me what I'd done. And there, in that moment, I seemed to not exist at all. There was only one feeling. The fall. As if being swallowed up by quicksand, my body descended through what I gathered to be some manner of vertical shaft, a long descent through that soft tropical sand in which I experienced total stasis. The descent went on as I felt it all around me, but could see only blackness. Now that I recall this moment, it seemed rather peaceful. Drifting even downward, I must have descended some great distance. All at once, the stasis came to an end. I could feel my diver's fins moving through the water again, and then my legs. My exhausted body fell through the last of the sand as I first found myself in that place which is haunted my soul ever since. I had descended some great distance and fallen into a deep sea cavern of gargantuan proportions. A deep blue haze filled the water akin to mist on a foggy mountain, ergo limiting my visibility to only several meters at most. Considering the clear tropical waters of the region, this blue haze appeared downright unnatural. There was no telling how deep the cavern fell before any kind of ground surface if anything, the strange cavern appeared as if by the hand of God. The ocean floor was turned upside down as all I could see only blue nothingness below. The top of the cavern was characterized by a curious black stone, that which I suspected to be the same as the horn-like protrusions we had seen earlier at the excavation site. During these moments of observation, I kept my place with one hand clinging to the edge of the vertical sand tunnel from which I had descended. Yet my urge to know what lied ahead implored me to let go and move onwards. Luckily, I always carried several glow sticks in case of operating at night, and with my driver's knife and some wire, I easily had the supplies to produce a makeshift lantern, or several for that matter, which I could use to find my way back to the vertical sand tunnel. Much to my shock, however, the sharp stainless steel of my knife couldn't as much as make a scratch on the obsidian-like black stone, and the sand seemed too loose to properly hold the knife or glow stick level. I was on my own. If I ventured further into the cavern, it would mean navigating my way back without any landmarks whatsoever. As I progressed, I began noticing how unnaturally cold the water was in addition to its bizarre haze. Also, the low rumbling sort of ambient sounds one expects to hear in the deep ocean were nowhere. Only silence. Not a single living thing appeared to dwell in that cavern. Out of the misty haze, a black shape began to emerge, something moving ever so slightly close to the black stone right above my head. A glint of silver came into light as well. <laughs> a scuba tank! Unimaginable relief washed over me as a jubilation I'd never known before or since came over my soul. I had found the geologist who'd sunk in earlier. Together, perhaps, we could discover what exactly we had happened upon. He sensed my presence and turned around to face my direction, waving me over. The geologist beckoned for me not to move and stay quiet before pointing downwards into the murky haze. For a moment, we floated in silence. Not understanding, I motioned to my counterpart to keep going, but he took my hand and held it up to the black stone. I could feel it now. Faint, but certain vibrations. 
The two of us descended into the blue gloom. Slowly as we approached, a towering mass became unveiled. The two of us propelled forward, intrigued by the sight before us. We had found the base of those twisted horns from the excavation site. Here they were, in the cavern, similarly smooth and almost sculpted in appearance. The twisting objects stemmed from a massive slab of the strange black stone which trailed off into the depths. We followed its path, but what could this bizarre and impressive sculpture be leading to? I took out a glow stick and cracked it on, the green luminescence piercing through the haze around us. The geologist did the same, and our descent seemingly came to an end as we stepped down onto a perfectly flat, perfectly smooth ground of the black stone, that which was not unlike a perfectly designed marble floor of a palace. Sheer bafflement set in. Who, or what, could have produced such a marvel? Now delirious with anticipation, we lethargically stumbled across the smooth ground. Through the green halo of our lights, I could now see a greater architecture coming into view. Masses of twisting black tentacle-like sculptures stood reaching ever upwards. We progressed, and more and more of these strange things surrounded us, as if we were in a nest of frozen octopus arms. I had ceased to think about the possibilities, but rather felt overwhelmed by an ancient feeling as we moved through the twisted masses. A greater structure was coming into view, and I felt I knew with certainty that it would hold the answers to all questions which any man had ever dreamt of. And there, in that other world, we at last found ourselves at the necropolis. We had merely seen the entrance to a monolithic structure, a dwelling of indescribable geometry and towering spires, all gleaming with dark magnificence. This was no human creation. If I had any doubt left, it was quickly wiped away by the alien monuments before us. There were several long, winding tunnels in the architecture which we could see. These circular passages stood easily several meters high and wide. What ghastly things could have purposed such tunnels is a thought I'd rather not dwell on. Our attention turned to a series of what appeared to be sculptures, those of the necropolis. A ways off from the winding tunnels stood more of the tentacle-like monuments, However, before each of these narrow, almost man-sized trenches that had been created in the stony ground, the geologist and I examined these trenches only to see once more that endless, deep blue haze. As we surveyed the area further, we found a seemingly endless row of the monuments and trenches, and collectively, we finally came to realize that we were, in fact, exploring an ancient necropolis, a collection of the dead from some past time. What this civilization had been, God, even now I cannot begin to imagine. My colleague intended to find out, however. He pointed downward into a trench, that narrow passage which could just barely fit a diver. I tried to stop him from going down, but nonetheless my comrade's scientific instinct got the better of him, and he decided that he would descend into that murky nothingness. I wondered if I had been wrong not to follow. I floated there in weightlessness, heartbeats ringing in my ears ever louder. What could my colleague find in that murky nothingness? What if we were to recover one of them? One of the things responsible for this cavern? These fantasies overwhelmed me as I waited, the occasional air bubbles of my colleague becoming all the more infrequent as he descended further. It must be quite a distance downward, I remember thinking numbly. The quiet, ambient rumbles and echoes of underwater were disrupted in an instant as the previously calm vibrations roared to life in a deafening artificial sounding bellow that filled the entire cavern 
I screamed into my mouthpiece as I could feel my body writhe in pain, my eyeballs vibrating against the horrible noise. As I reeled in pain, the geologist shot out of the burial trench, clawing his way upward with mad intensity. It was then I realized his air tank and face mask were gone. The geologist faced my direction, his eyes bulging and mouth agape, no doubt drawing in water as he attempted to scream. Blood trickled from his eyes and dissipated in the hazy water. He reached out for me, fingers spasming and entire body shaking violently as I saw he was desperately attempting to form words with his mouth. But as I extended my hand, his body stiffened and his eyes rolled back. I watched as my colleague's body went limp and slowly floated upward to the roof of the cavern. He had seen one of them. That awful near-mechanical roar bellowed through the cavern once more. Fearing for my very soul, I frantically searched for the sand tunnel from before, but it was nowhere to be seen. My only escape may as well have been invisible in that murky water, and then only then did I realize I was nearly out of air. Either I would escape quickly, suffocate in the cavern, or meet whatever twisted fate my friend had just experienced. My exhausted body pushed forward, compelled by the urge to survive against all odds, black stone and hazy water, an infinite ocean, all on its own. That's what the cavern felt like. Only a few minutes of air left, I discovered with the stress. For a third time, the roar sounded, and before I could as much as process my final thought, my entire body lurched forward, my limbs dangling before me as something dragged my body with unspeakable speed and force. Desperately, my hands clasped at something tightly ensnared around my waist, something too powerful and smooth to possibly move with my hands. In just a brief flash, my body kneeled in on itself, and I caught a glimpse of a pitch-black stone-like limb constricting my lower half. Madness set in as I screamed, oh, how I screamed through the last of my oxygen as this alien thing dragged me into one of the trenches, this entire necropolis feeling alive with only an intent to kill me through its horrible and unnatural methods. But I did not die. Upon being pulled into the trench by that thing, my senses were bombarded with flashes of white light and an almost mechanical noise which surely wasn't of this world. There was a final sensation of my body being ripped apart in all directions before all of my senses were cut off. Blackness. Indifferent nothingness, only vaguely comprehensible, followed. I recognized a distant voice, barely recognizable as my own, whispering somewhere distant, so. This is death. It's emptier than I imagined. Absolute darkness did not last. Within moments, an ever-so-distant glimmer came into view, a faint flickering. Sound became audible once more. However, only a quiet, near-silent rumbling persisted. And at this time I felt ethereal, as if it were an out-of-body experience. I was moving closer to the distant light, yet I couldn't feel any physical presence in this near-silent nothingness. I was almost at the light when a grotesque face made itself present on the other side, one which was distinguishedly familiar yet filled me with relief. <laughs> it was an anglerfish, its faint light glimmering a macabre, deathly paleness as it swam past me with indifference. My thoughts returned. I must be in abyssal depths. But how? What is this, any of this? Am I still in the necropolis? I felt a distant movement once more, as if the water were carrying me forward. There was a vague, cold awareness of abyssal water. Before I could comprehend anything else, I recall a blinding flash of piercing green light, as I could see the necropolis bathed in an otherworldly illumination defying explanation, the necropolis itself was clearly not the same as when I had just been moments ago. Rather, it appeared as if it were being shown the strange alien place at a societal peak. Those twisted black limbs stood not as statues, but rather in a state of fixed, 
undulation, a writhing colony of the oddities which I had previously mistook as stationary. Silhouetted against the green haze surrounding the necropolis, a monolithic shadow passed through the murky water, a ghastly creature of such massive proportions that it troubles me to bring its bizarre prehistoric shaped body to words even as I had only witnessed it as a passing shadow. My attention shifted towards the necropolis itself where a congregation of disturbing things circled around one of the trenches, a fresh tomb presumably, and partook in some manner of death ritual. Those things which I witnessed, completely inhuman and unnatural in form, vaguely similar only to a multi-legged virus, grotesque being suspended by a spider-like set of legs, devoid of any other limbs or external facial features, but rather twisted heads characterized by a dark, jagged texture. And there, during the death ritual, a foul chorus of otherworldly shrieks erupted into the dark waters. Such an uncanny singing which haunts me still to this very moment. Somewhere, however, my being existed. I attempted to cry out in protest of this bizarre torture, but there was no way for me to cry out, no way to flee the scene or shut my eyes, nothing! I could only exist and experienced the ritual which I could feel chipping away at whatever made me cling to spiritual survival. As the horrid sounds overwhelmed every last corner of my being, the vision before me was torn apart as if my perspective were that of corrupted footage. And as those deep ocean sirens drifted off into abyssal nothingness, Mercifully, the torment ended. I felt that I was falling. By the time I had come to, there was nothing in my mind which allowed the possibility of survival. No, I was dead, damned to eternal suffering in that sunken necropolis. That was not the case, however. I remember brief flashes of being hoisted up onto our research vessel and cries of relief from my fellow scientists. According to what I was told later, they'd found me miles away from the boat, floating face up in the water without a scuba mask or air tank. I was murmuring some incoherent ramble as they grabbed me and brought my limp body aboard. That was how they knew immediately I was still alive. Official reports concluded that my geologist colleague and myself had been trapped in an air pocket below the ocean floor. That he hadn't been lucky, but somehow I made it out and was carried by the current closer towards the mainland of Fiji. By all accounts, my survival was a miracle. The expedition was called off as Fiji's government sent in divers to recover the body of my lost colleague. They knew they wouldn't find him, though. Rather, they sent in a team to secure and seal the entire excavation site. Why they were too short-sighted before, I presume, to be attributed to horrible mismanagement, or perhaps lack thereof, on the behalf of idiotic bureaucrats. Everyone's done their best to accommodate me. But I highly doubt even the team who worked at the excavation site before us could begin to understand that which I experienced. In my dreams, I'm there in the necropolis existing against my own will in that endless out-of-body experience, and the same scene plays out forevermore, always concluding with the death ritual. After living through this miserable experience night after night, I decided no more, that I would end my own life to stop the misery. But they won't let me. Something about my body was altered during the experience. There was something now... In my brain, an involuntary element which prevents me from committing suicide. I've tried everything, and against my own will, my body will not destroy itself in any way. Hours ago, I received a message so kindly delivered to me by the government-monitored living quarters I've been accommodated with. 
There are officials who wish to interview me. I know what this means. That I'll just be something for them to put in a lab and study. There may even be a secret community within the government already devoted to studying the necropolis, or a larger society which deals with instances such as my own. I'll not have it. I'll not be silenced. This has been my story, the truth about Oceana's necropolis. After this becomes known to the world, I will flee the country by any means necessary, and I will never stop running. Perhaps now other survivors of phenomena similar to what I've dealt with may come forward, and so I will carry on. The nightmare is due to return every night, and as I vanish into the unknown, those sirens still calling to me from the abysmal city... I now have nothing but deep sympathy for mankind, desperately trying to exist in a universe so beyond our comprehension. There is, however, one final truth which I've come to realize. The necropolis I beheld was merely the gateway into a much larger society, one which we scientists stumbled upon out of mere coincidence. There are others. And that which remains unseen, an entire world unknown to all man, we are not welcomed there. I beg of you, then, to be aware of this unspeakable truth, but not dwell on it as I do. For when the sunken ones should have enough of man's prodding into their world, we will not stand a chance. Well, explorers, what say you? Does this sunken world really exist beneath ours? Do other intelligent life forms share this planet with human beings? Why do the sunken ones visit our narrator in his dreams? What do they need him for? That, my dear listeners, is for you to decide. Join us next time as we search for even more mysteries as we head deep into the fog. In the Fog was created by Paul Kelly Jr. and Lionel Jeffries. Written by Lionel Jeffries. Edited and produced by Paul Kelly Jr. Music by Doug Maxwell Join us next time as we look at the distinguished and unique clockwork that created a monster. <laughs>